there's regionally specific systems that are going to going to work and it's about we need to develop those systems um going going forward and working yeah. working with farmers and this is the thing for me you know as you know farmers are really resourceful people and all the all the solutions i reckon are, are trapped in in farmers heads and we just need to facilitate and enable those farmers that was Mick Whittenhall, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally and their continuing connection to culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott and in this podcast series I'll be uncovering the world of regenerative agriculture, its people, practices and principles and empowering you to apply their learnings and experience to your business and life. I'm an eighth generational Australian farmer who transitioned my family farm from industrial methods to holistic regenerative practices. Join me as I dive deep into the regenerative journeys of other farmers, chefs, health practitioners and anyone else who's up for yarn and find out why and how they transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with Charlie Arnott. G'day. Uh, today's interview is with Mick Wettenhall, a farmer from Trangy in New South Wales. Um, I've known Mick for, for quite some time now and uh, stoked to be sitting on his uh, his veranda here at Weema Bar at Trangy and we talked about all sorts of things, um, the amazing um, farming uh, initiatives he's implementing here from going from sort of I guess a conventional farming situation to one where he's using and creating and making his own own products and um, helping develop a very interesting um, inoculation uh, uh, product that uh, he, you know a couple of mates dug up a few years ago and <laughs> let's see it was, it was dug up um, from, by a professor in uh, in Sydney um, you'll have to listen to the interview to get all the detail but fascinating stuff and just goes to show how some very simple um simple things simple opportunities and 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 simple um essentially will be practices can make a huge difference to the sequestration of carbon essentially um we talked about all sorts of things this will be a part a two-part series um uh, interview this one we <laughs> We went for we I think we did break all records this time, um, so I won't spoil it all now. But uh, welcome to um, and hope you enjoy uh, this interview with um, Mick Wettenhall. Mick Wettenhall, um, welcome to the Regenerative Journey show. Thanks for having me, Charlie. Welcome to your veranda at uh, here at uh, Weema Bar mm. at, uh, at Trangy. Yep. I was wondering how long it was take you to get to the bottom of the bucket and you've only – how many episodes you've done and you got to me? <laughs> well, look, as I said to a fellow the other day, um, I interviewed Murray Pryor at Yass, <clears throat> near, the, or near Yass, and uh, I said, mate, um, Charlie Massey can't, um, can't do it t- tomorrow. Can I do you? Oh. <laughs> so um, – and you were third on the list. Oh, so, yes, yeah. no, no, <clears throat> I have to say I'm, I'm – um, uh, I got in last night. We had a good chat. We had a good chat this morning. And um, which was wonderful because I've been watching you from afar and we've known each other for a long time and mm-hmm. I've just been, you know, it was a really good excuse just to drill down um, into what, uh, you know, what, you, what you've been doing, <clears throat> which we'll get to. And I'm going to stop coughing in a minute or, or, or <clears throat> scratching my throat. Now I'm going to, um, Mick, I'm going to go straight to the guts of it right now, straight up. <clears throat> when does a Michael become a Mick or a Mike? Yeah, right. Um, I suppose that's, geez, um, I've been Mick for probably, yeah, Forever. 40 years, I'd say. Yeah, I was Mike as a as a kid, primary school, and then I migrated to a Mick. I don't know why, mate. Yeah, <coughs> so you were, you were a Mike for yeah, a Yeah, well, I suppose I was Mike by my family, and then I just, I don't know, I preferred Mick. No, <clears throat> just a bit of an abbreviation. So it was your choice. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Don't know. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Well, we've got oh, that's it. That's pretty yeah. much it. Oh, yeah. we've, we've we've hit the peak. That's it. That's, that's, <laughs> we've peaked that's the interview. Radio gold, <laughs> <laughs> right there, mate. Um, let's get down to tin tax. We're sitting at the uh, Weema Bar on the Weema Bar um, Homestead veranda, or one of them, um, looking out 
upon your beautiful garden here and we'll get to sort of a bit of the history there. What does it mean for you to be sitting here, you know, um, looking looking out there, you know, sort of set the scene for listeners as to sort of our setting and, and, and what, what, what being here means to you? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think country life is is the best kept secret, uh, really. You know, I mean, I love uh, I love to go to the city. I love Sydney and all it has to offer. I love to travel and go places and you know go to the beach and um, you know we go to the beach on holidays. But I always come back here and it's sort of you're walking around the garden here after you've been away in the city for a couple of weeks or, or you know at a time and and it's just. Where the silence is sort of deafening, almost, you know, and it's just—I just think we're lucky to have the best of both worlds, where you you get this this sort of um, experience of of city life, as you and I have both both have experienced, but also get to bring our kids up in a you know such a um, such an open and um, free in, you know environment. And how long how long have you been back here? Um, we were talking about it a bit last night. Mm. Um, actually, let's go back further. Yep. Let's go back to, I guess, formative years and sort of, I mean, you're a farmer yep. and you're, you're doing a wonderful job and, and, and have a big, I believe, a big, um, not that you haven't had a big sort of past already, but, but there's lots of really cool, interesting projects on the horizon and already sort of being achieved. But, you know, before you were farming and doing this, what, what, what was when you were, when you, when you were Mike, <laughs> in your well, that's, pre- that's a long that's a long time ago <laughs> yeah or well, maybe just after you became mick i mean what what was your life um not so much like but like you know just to, just as a reference point for what you're doing now what, what what was you know where where did it all start where was where was the hankering for farming start oh yeah it- i've always been a, a country kid always loved the bush um yeah you know left school went to the territory did all those sort of things worked um, you know, in an industry, um, yeah, um, and that's I suppose where it, you know, where it all started. Um, and then when Kirst and I were married, there was an opportunity to come out here and um, and work on Wema Bar with um, George's uh, with Kirst's dad, uh, George. Um, and we've been out here for the last sort of uh, yeah since two thousand one, I suppose. So we've sort of been through that whole family succession. She's the youngest of, of three girls. Um, so, yeah, it's been, um, well, I th- you know, I, I think there's, it's, it's worked really well that, that they've um, kept the family home and everyone come, you know, comes back and enjoys coming back to Wema Bar and, and um, it's a real sort of, you know, hub, I suppose. Mm. And <clears throat> was there, um, I guess, did you have a sense of when you were younger, you know, I mean, Obviously, you you met Kirsty at some point there, and 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 you know the rest is history, as it were. But was there a sense of how what sort of farming you wanted to do, or where you wanted to live, or you know was there sort of a was it just like I just want to be living in the country doing doing stuff? <clears throat> yeah, I was always destined for a um, career in agriculture, mm. um, and I was in you know living in Sydney at the time, and um, which seemed quite strange. Was kicking around down there doing all sorts of different gigs um, this is after after. At what what age were you? Yeah, so this is sort of, I suppose, yeah, um, mid twenties. So mm-hmm. I sort of left the bush and went to Sydney and lived down there for a bit. And I was working in construction and um, uh, you know, a number of different uh, gigs down there. Um, and I was rodeoing at the time, and that was you know, so I'd spent a lot of time travelling doing that. Um, yeah, right. And I, it was something I really enjoyed and did for a good few years. So Sydney was a pretty central place to travel out of. Um, where, what were you riding? What was your what was your um, was, your, your favoured um, event? Oh, mate, I was a saddle bronc rider, and not a very good one, but um, I yeah, I didn't I enjoyed it. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. Met a lot of great blokes, and you know, mm. saw a lot of the countryside. Went to um, you know, went to Canada and and um, yeah, did a season and that over there, which was was a lot of fun, and yeah. And, uh, any 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 injuries that uh, you can yeah, talk about? You got a mate. you got a bit of a weird gait about you when you're yeah. sort of <laughs> waddling across the garden there. Well, mate, I have got no <laughs> cartilage in my left knee. That's due to that. But apart from that, it was fine. I think it's yeah, it's not as bad as people make out. I think probably rugby's probably harder harder on the body than, than saddle bronc <laughs> riding. You know, what did you learn from saddle bronc riding? Was was there a reason you did it in that you were, I don't know, 
proving something to yourself, or was it was it, or maybe not been no, not necessarily an intention about that, but was there sort of some anything you learned, life lessons you learned from it? Well, it made I think. Um, yeah, I suppose you have to. Yeah, it's that whole balance of of fear and anxiety and uh, and things like that. You have to, you know, you have to sort of overcome. There's there's no greater feeling, I reckon. You know, um, when it when it like a good saddle bronc ride feels really good, but a terrible one feels bloody ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's almost like it's a bit like the golf. Mm. You know, that one good shot at golf that yeah. has you keep going back. That's yeah. that. You know, you get that, um, you get that timing and that rhythm when you um, on a on a you know on a good saddle bronc course, and it's yeah, it's a lot of a lot of fun, and you're trying to recreate that. Mm. So, what um, back to the farming um, caper? What was the, I guess, explain if you could the sort of the the type of farming. Yeah, you know, what was in a typical day, or, or what what sort of how would you describe the farming that you were doing when you when you came back in. Two thousand and one, you know, was it? Um, you know, we're at Trangy. You know, it was yeah. a typical sort of, um, uh, yeah, you know, farming sort of enterprise mix here. Is yep. anywhere else in, in the district? And yeah, so um, traditionally, you know, Weema Bar's um, uh, an irrigation property on the banks of the Quarry River here. So um, a sort of river alluvium um, that um, you know predominantly um, to sort of heavy um, black. Herdersolves. Um, so we were, yeah, generally cotton growing. George was growing a lot of cotton at the time, and there was you know, Ir- seemed, irrigated, <coughs> lovely, irrigated, irrigated yeah, cotton. Yeah, right, right. And uh, when I sort of came out here, you know, he's growing a thousand acres of cotton, sort of year in year out. It's one of those things. If you didn't have the water, you'd pull the beds up because you generally got the water. You know what I mean? And you'd punt on getting that water, and more often than not, it would rain through the season. The dam would get a bit more water, get a bit more allocation, and you'd sneak through. Um, that model just doesn't seem to be applicable anymore. And whether just the 90s it was just that era that they could, was that snapshot in time that could be, um, they could do that. Um, do you th- was it a seasonal thing? You, th- you think the seasons have changed that there's sort of not the, um, there's not the rainfall up the river to supply the just, water or just the, or the, or the, the, the in season rain that's falling or what? What's well, it just seems that way. I mean, we're just not getting the allocation, you know, <coughs> that, that we did. Um, once upon a time, like mm. it was just do it year in year out. Like I say, grow that, pull those beds up, and and plant that cotton. Away so, you go. Mm, so, um, and it's something I wasn't ever exposed to cotton growing before, and and it was sort of, you know, and that was the, the bad old days of probably cotton growing. If you, it's one of those things. If you weren't sort of born into it, it sort of, uh, I you know found it did sort of challenge my, um, uh, challenge me a bit. You know, mm. in what what it was that we're doing, because there was a lot of, um, you know, probably at the stage up to sort of fifteen um, sprays in a in a season it was just horrendous. You know, and that's funny for heliothus. Heliothus, or for, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's funny you say that because you're not the first. I mean, in the last, I reckon week, and I can't think where I've been to Broken Hill for a couple of days, but maybe it was out there. I heard exactly the same thing about cotton. If you're not born into it. Then mm. it's a, it's a it's a <clears throat> it can be a challenge to sort of get get into or stay in or sort of get your head around. So interesting. Yeah, and I was sort of uh, thought, well, I have to work out a way to do it differently um, uh, if we're going to continue to do it because I was just you know I was just finding it really really challenging to you know to be putting putting out um, yeah synthetic pyrethroids that are just toweling every insect in the paddock. You know, like it was. But it's the uh, cotton industry has been really progressive and has has moved a long way in the last um, you know two decades that I've been involved. I can't believe I'm saying that. Two decades, yeah, old, old boy. Yeah. yeah, I know. But um, and it really has moved um, a long way. But it's still and it is continuing to evolve and 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 grow. And I think. This is one of the challenges that we have, don't we? That a lot of people, you know, you get on social media and you hear people talk about uh, cotton. Oh, geez, it uses all the water, and we shouldn't have cotton, and we should be growing hemp. You know, and thinking, well, that's fine. Like, I'll, you know, let's develop a hemp industry, and I'll give that a crack as as well. But you know, trying to grow. This is what people don't sort of realise. If you grow hemp in an industrial model, like we're growing cotton in an industrial model, you're growing a grass, uh, you know, or a plant that grows to. And I'm not sure of the agronomics of it, but it grows 
really tall really quickly. So that, to me, says it's going to use a lot of um, nitrogen. There's going to be people chasing yield, and you're just going to be in, in the same predicament that the cotton industry's, you know, in. So, uh, mm. yeah, I think... And as I said, the cotton industry is really progressing and starting to, you know, they're acknowledging um, the challenges we've got with climate change um, and how we're going to mitigate that, and, um, you know, going forward. So people criticise it, uh, sitting there in their bloody cotton socks and their cotton undies and their, you know, <laughs> it's sort of, yeah. You've got to it's still, it. I get the end of the day, like if, if it, yeah, as you say, if it's, a, if it's a hemp that they're looking that, you know, is going to be the, the alternative, um, yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> it's still a monoculture. Yes, it might be more water efficient, but it's still going to need. It's going to burn diesel to plant. It's going to burn diesel to to harvest. It's going to be. Yeah, there's going to be all sorts of other, you know, good or bad consequences that that um, a lot of farmers who are growing it probably don't even haven't worked out mm. yet. You know, it's sort of it's simple, no silver bullet, is it? No, it's not, mate. It's not, and it's the simple um, reality of ag- agronomics. You know, a crop that's going to grow that amount of biomass is going to need a lot of. You know, it's going to need a lot of time to get over that, you know, mm. but trying to do it, you know, year in, year out or something, you're going to be faced with the same predicament. So, yeah, I'm a, you know, a big believer that agriculture needs to be an evolution, not a revolution, if you know what I mean. I, I'm really inspired by about the opportunities that we have with agriculture going forward. Um, but it's not, you know, that we necessarily need to move away, but we need to evolve to, to systems that can protect that natural capital and enhance that. And a lot of – there's a great misconception, I think, out there and probably in mainstream saying in agriculture anyway that, that the choice is binary. We have to have, you know, soil health or production and, you know, or soil carbon and production. But at the end of the day, we, we our systems need to get to a – a point where we've got enough, you know, carbon in our soil that's actually driving that production, um, and that's we will grow more food mm. with carbon in the soil and better and better quality food. And I think it's a good point, uh, Mick. You know, and and then just sort of steering it towards a, a grazing and sort of meat production um, uh, direction. There, you know, it's a bit like saying, "Oh, <clears throat> we've got to get rid of all the cows out of the environment because they're farting and you know killing the planet." It's like, well. We can actually do both. We can actually still – we actually need, you know, ruminants in the landscape because they used to be and, yep. you know, they've been taken out and replaced with other types of ruminants and other grazing animals. But, you know, <clears throat> we can still um, produce meat and that's in, that's a whole other sort of argument – or not argument but sort of conversation. But but we can use them as a tool to, to sequester carbon. So um, <clears throat> it's, not a, it's not a matter of – this or that, it's this and that, isn't it? You know, we can produce stuff and we can we can build soil carbon and we can, you know, feed the world and we can actually improve the environment and all its functionality that um, that, that is required, really required of us as farmers to take responsi- responsibility um, for. Because we were talking last night about, um, you know, the environment subsidising the food system yeah. you know, at, the, at the moment. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and it has for... For many, uh, many, many years. No, but you know the onus can't be on the on the farmer to do it without the goodness of his heart. And this is <laughs> totally. the thing. And this is where I'm a you know a big believer that we need to remunerate um, farmers um, for you know for this work. And and the best and simplest way to do that is to put a price on on carbon. And <clears throat> you know, it's like I was saying to you, I, I envisage the day that's not too far away that. That carbon needs to be a line item on a on a balance sheet, um, and that when we'll make like all of our enterprises, we'll make decisions around that. Um, mm. But at this stage, no one's picking up a tab um, for the cost of it. So this extractive model of agriculture that we seem to have um, is eroding that that soil carbon, um, and it's quite uh, the, the thing about it. It's it's quite elusive because it's like that frog boiling in the pot scenario. It's sort of that three percent every year that we need more to get the same same results, and that we don't really see it happening. But it's like the frog boiling in the pot slowly mm-hmm. turn the temperature up, and he, before he know it, he knows that he's cooked. You know, um, and that's it's a really good analogy for 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 the industrial agricultural um, model. Yeah, let's get back to um, <clears throat> twenty years ago. So there's cotton in the paddock. Um, there's uh, what else is running around? What else is? Yeah, so cotton, uh, wheat, cereals, uh, yeah, 
pulses, all the mm. general farming stuff, beef cattle. Um, yeah, George um, had a shorthorn stud. Of um, course. <laughs> which we no longer have. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I knew no. that was going to be Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, the shorties are gone. Okay, yeah. uh, Mick, that was a lovely interview. Uh, <laughs> thank, thanks for your time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but that was, yeah, and we ha- we haven't moved that far away from that model now, I suppose um, we're probably doing less dry land farming maybe than we did. You know, there's a lot of sort of wheat loose and rotation on the river here that we don't sort of do a lot more of um, anymore. I'm sort of doing more, um, yeah, more sort of multi-species forage sort of crops, um, you know, trying to drive that that biological function and, and you know, address that. So um, there was a <clears> – <throat> so you, you you jumped back in the – well, jumped into the, the driver's seat here, as it were, um, and um, was there – so, so you know, I guess, you know, in a, in a mixed farming operation here at Trangy, um, which was – was that similar to a lot of other farmers in the area? Was that a sort of a bit of a – you know, you didn't you, – you were, let's just say, a normal farmer back then, as in you you, you were – were you doing pretty few, much? Or were you doing a few weird things there? Oh, mate, no, I'm always been bloody weird, you know. That. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit of a yeah. Uh, um, I don't know. I've always had a thirst for knowledge. I just I love learning. I'm a self confessed ped head, you know. Like I'm just uh, I'm fascinated by soil, and and I came out for jo- drove George mad. I think uh, you know, like all the training I did on it. You know, I went and did the laning and, and you know. Uh, Graham Sate, all the different, any course that was on agriculture, I went and did, did the holistic management training and that's where we met. And, um, yeah, uh, so it was sort of all around, I've had this fascination for how we can do things differently in agriculture and, uh, um, yeah, and I've tried on a number of different things along the way and, uh, yeah, it's like it just keeps keeps evolving, I suppose, and there's just, yeah, it's just so fascinating. It's just, we can just know a fraction of what there is to know about soil and how it functions, and it's just, it just really fills me um, with hope and mm. a, and um, inspiration about um, the opportunities for our industry going forward, you know, moving to a low-carbon economy and, and the potential we have. And like our, our soils at sub-1% soil carbon, if you had to put a figure on it of their their capacity, the you know, the, their the, the the capacity that they're operating operating at at that is just is it ten fifteen percent of what they could potentially do? Yeah. Like who knows what that number is? But it's quite exciting, though. Isn't it, it really is exciting. And I said, there's some real low fruit here, and mm-hmm. we just had there's some nuts that just definitely need cracking, and that's what you know, <laughs> that's what we're all about. You know, what what was <clears throat> what was if I can ask what what was George thinking about? Um, this this son-in-law who was running around doing all this stuff and using words he probably hadn't heard before and maybe experimenting here and there was he was he sort of um, how how did that sort of fit into the to the to the to then current farming you know practice <laughs> one word extremely patient I think <laughs> um, good poor, on poor George yeah um, <clears throat> and. Um, I think you know I dragged him up some gullies where he probably didn't didn't necessarily want to go and um, yeah and he he run a re- he's you know run a really successful farming business mm. um, it's not like I think young blokes and I look back now you know young blokes can come tearing headlong in it's just like you know buddy I'll get out buddy you know doing it all wrong <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. How, know, that's how it can be perceived mm. um, <coughs> and yeah it, it sort of um, it wasn't that way at all but that's the way it can land I suppose you know and that's um, like I said he was extremely patient we've got a you know we had a as you know family secession and things like that he's been he's done a magnificent job of of um of doing that and it's real yeah credit to Mm. to what he's achieved here and um, yeah what he's been what he's done because it's not often the ways that I'm I'm sure you know a few maybe even similar same people you know that Unfortunately, families don't get to the point of working that out, and, and it can end in um, end uh, very messily. It's uh, interesting, isn't it? That mm-hmm. one, like it's sort of um, Lynn Sykes, I reckon, summed it up 
uh, in a statement. She said, so much with agriculture, she said, with professions, so much of who they are is tied up in what they do. So take away being a farmer mm. or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like You are not of, what you do. Yeah, yeah. So, and I thought that is, that's that's so true. And there's another, and I suppose where the the issues are with secession and different um, different generations, it's attitude to risk, you know, that the older generation generally don't want to take the risk and the younger generation uh, do. So it's sort mm. of, and then you might have two or three, you know, different families that are involved. Lynn Sykes also said another thing um, to me. She said, that uh, just because your family doesn't qualify you to go into business together, and she said, "There's no other industry that does that, but yeah. agriculture does it." You know, there's an expectation, you, isn't there? Really? You generally, you, know, you go and pick a business partner. You know, get someone who has the skills that you do that, the, that you, do that you, you don't, with? and yeah, whatever. And you say, "Okay, this is going to work." No, you're my brother. Let's go, and then we're going to bring a couple of wives into it and complicate it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um. Now, where are we going to go now? Oh, so so Mick, when uh, so running a running a, um, a farming business, and w- where did was there a particular point in time that um, you remember to be a significant, you know, turning point or or, or, or a point in point that you know changed? You might have been going from dabbling in this and dabbling that and that to no, this is actually something I've really got to focus a bit more on yeah like i said i've uh, um i've been a real seeker I've, I've loved doing any training any courses anything like that i did a lot of the, the um the courses that i led to there before like th- things like you know grazing for profit and all that they were a bit of a breakthrough moment um for me um it, it did make a make a lot of sense um you know and i've practiced it for the last 20 years it, it can Tend to be a bit idealistic, um, yeah, and it um, and the and a big issue with a lot of it too that it can be. A, I see it, it's a bit exclusive. It can be a bit sort of holier than now to the mainstream, and I think that's something that needs to be overcome with that. But um, what just what what was the <clears throat> what what was it that was that was leading you? I think to even go to the, some of these courses or was it was it was it a, a hunger for something or you were getting away from something else or was there yeah sort of yeah, a, yeah okay yeah no i suppose it was just i wanted to be able to do things differently i okay. uh, i didn't uh, yeah that the typical agricultural industrial agricultural model was something that i struggled with and i wanted to be able to learn how to do things differently so i did the actual farming for uh, um for profit i think was probably one of the first ones that they came in and we started looking in different things and i was working with um you know bart davidson he was I still laugh with Bart about it now, you know, having covered in fish guts and bloody, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he loved that. And uh, making, my own, <clears throat> making my own brewers and things, you know, like I was just, uh, yeah, I was trying all these different sort of things on and we're just exploring, I suppose. It was really sort of early days and, um, you know, we're getting to a point now where we're refining things mm. probably a bit more. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Picking up some courses, getting getting on the page, um, defining moments. Yeah, yep. Um, I think uh, that was really, uh, yeah. I suppose those a thirst for wanting to do things mm. um, differently um, was 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 the key key driver. So, um, and where where was the <clears throat> back to the turning points? Was there a um, was there something that, that happened, or a series of events? Was it a you know, as Charlie Massey says, a, a tension event, or was it, or, or or was it a slow burn, or you know? Yeah, well, it, like I said, always this drive to try and build carbon in our in our farming systems, and um, I, I think well, it was two thousand six um, at an at an RCS conference in Sydney. I still remember it um, that um, Tim Flannery. Um, was the speaker and climate change was something that I hadn't really ever heard of. Like I don't, I don't know, I must have been under a freaking rock or something. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this bloke came. I just bl- absolutely blindsided me. Like it sort of, um, yeah, he started talking about uh, the issues that we had, and it's you know it's all happening now. And he had photos of, of glaciers that were retreating, and I thought, geez. Um, and I, was, I remember going out after it. Um, 
you know, after Smoko after the, the breakout session after the after the talk, and it was the general consensus of a group of farmers. Geez, he's, he's a happy bloke, isn't he? You know, like what a load of shit I've heard about that. It's all crap, you know. And I'm thinking, is it really? Like it seemed, <laughs> it seemed like like he, you know, pretty convincing what he was talking about. Yeah, he had some, he had some, he had some pretty stuff, good yeah. points. Like, yeah. nah, 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 it's all rubbish. Um, anyway, I went home and I read his book. The uh, um the weathermakers weathermakers yeah yeah um yeah I remember I think each each chapter had a quote at the start but never one quote really stuck with me he said when humans had a have a choice between starvation and raiding humans raid and I thought mm. <laughs> you know well, that's and that's um you know that's the reality of climate change if it goes unabated and and that's been I suppose for me it's almost yeah, coming out in rural in a rural setting or rural circles and say that you believe in climate change back in two thousand six is like almost you saying you're gay in nineteen fifty <coughs> or whatever. That's, you yeah, know? you'd have um, been you'd have been hung, drawn, and quartered totally. in town square. Totally. Um, you know, so but it's something. Yeah, stand for something or you'll fall for anything is the is the saying, isn't it? And I and I have been a real a real advocate for it. And I spent, I suppose, I looked at it more and more, and and I found myself being quite depressed and quite fearful um, and then realised that that's, that doesn't help the situation and then I just think now I'm just I'm really inspired about the opportunities that are right there on the point of our nose for, for our industry in, in the potential for agriculture to become you know, a, a climate mitigating force. Yeah. So tell me about that, <clears throat> Mick. What's what have you what have you instigated? What, what sort of direction? What path? What journey are you on now? Where that had been a catalyst? What was some? You know, so what did you? What were some of the first things yep. you did? You had the sort of let's call it catalyst, epiphany, whatever it was. Then what was it? What was your next sort of step? Did you get home and go right? We're going to do this, that, the other, or what was where? What was that sort of next step from that that turning point? Yeah, I'd been working. Um, uh, with Guy Consultancy at, at Forbes, excuse me, um, who Guy Webb, who's um, yeah, now a great mate of mine and we've been working together for the last sort of, I, don't know, I suppose it's probably now, should have known Guy for probably 15 odd years and we'd been working together. Um, I couldn't sort of find an agronomist locally that was thinking the same way and, and, and Guy had, um, you know, was looking at how we develop systems that can, um, build carbon and soil, and we were both looking at carbon and soil basically from a um, productivity perspective, which we all need to look at it from, obviously. Um, but then, yeah, and we he he too um, had been bitten by the whole um, climate change sort of bug and and realised the um, the potential in agriculture, and that's where the two of us really um, struck a chord, I suppose, with each other and. Um, it was one event in particular. Um, so we'd been working together in the paddock, you know, obviously trying to build carbon in soils. You'd think it's just about building biomass, you know, the more biomass, more carbon in, should be more carbon kept. Um, and Guy went to the carbon conference in Dubbo in 2013, last speaker of a two-day seminar, um, was a guy called Peter McGee, retired scientist out of Sydney University. And um, he, it was groundbreaking work that just sort of fell on deaf ears at the end of a, a, a long conference. And a uh, guy thought, my God, this bloke's just got the keys to the universe um, and thought he wouldn't be able to talk to this bloke at the end of the end of the conference. Um, he thought they'll be 15 deep mobbed. and um, mobbed. And um, he was the only one that went back and said, tell me more about it. Um, so basically Peter Peter's work, he's a, um, he was a mycologist and – uh, he ha- had they'd found carbon um, inside of microaggregates in soil that were dated to hundreds of thousands of years old. So, and that made sense to him um, because inside of a microaggregate, it's it's an oxygen free environment. So there are there are two um, key uh, elements if, of how we lose. Um, uh, carbon in soil, and that's um, hydrolysis and oxidation. So wherever there's air, wherever it's exposed to air, or whether it's exposed to, to water, mm. carbon will be 
will be lost relative to particle size and time. Doesn't matter what it is, um, even if it's a um, a water stable like a humic compound, it can still be oxidized, albeit slower, mm -hmm. but it can be oxidized. And that's what I never realized that, you know. And I was saying to Peter because then guy got Peter out did a did a conference at Grenfell. And, you know, I was one of 12 farmers or something in the room, average age 65. Um, it, it tends to be, you know, when you go to these yeah. things. And he just had this, I was just, it was like an epiphany. Um, and I'm not saying this is the only way that you can build car carbon in soil, but it is a, a another way that um, that we can do it. So the so back to that carbon that they found, it was inside of a microaggregate. So... Um, Put a line through plants straight away because root hairs physically won't fit inside of a microaggregate. Um, so started doing their work with fungi. How did that carbon get inside that microaggregate? Um, started doing their work with fungi and they uncovered a specific set of species called melanized endophytic fungi. fungi. So they're an endophyte, just like rhizobium bacteria, an endophyte that sequesters um, nitrogen. Um, and so they um, did the... Uh, there was a PhD student um, did his work on it and they found the results were um, increased soil carbon by 17% in 14 weeks using subclover. Um, which was Using subclover that was inoculated? Inoculated. With this particular? With, with these particular yeah, set of organisms. Yeah, 17%. Phenomenal numbers, like it really is. And, and this is... And this is where I suppose we've really struggled getting the technology up because it just flies in the face of what everyone considers as normal for um, for being able to build carbon. Carbon has always been thought of as being really hard to um, to build um, in soil. It takes it's quite transient. It takes a long time, and it's easily lost and all this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, his work suggested that this wasn't the case, and and um, it sort of, I don't know, of almost, they say science progresses one funeral at a time. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really good saying, that one. I think, you know, a lot of people have had their whole career been around soil science and yeah. said, oh, that's just not possible, it can't, can't happen. And I think that's where we sort of struggle. So after that, um, after that meeting with Peter, we said, well, where's it all up to? You know, well, what's the next step? When can we buy some of this? Because this, this sounds fantastic. And he said that... Um, I'm retiring, Sydney Uni's not taking the work forward. Um, yeah, so I've tried to um, get people engaged in what it is that I'm doing and he said it's – I've basically given up. He said, I'm just going to – I'm retiring. And uh, go on, I just thought this – we just can't let this happen. Mm. Like a technology like this to let the, let it die in the annals of academia um, would just be an absolute travesty. So Guy and I, <laughs> we laugh about it now probably, but – um, you know, uh, we we thought we'd um, we'd take it take it forward. We got some of the some of the um, the strains that they used in the in the trials and brought them back. Um, and did a couple of different trials. I did a trial on here at cotton on cotton. We thought we'll get it into agricultural soils where we see you know the typical you know issues that we see in agriculture of chemicals and tillage and all that sort of stuff. And it and it won't work. It'll just be that controlled environment that it did work. But we got a result in in cotton. Um, got a result in um, uh, in canola. Um, you know, we've uh, yeah. So we've been trialing it along the way on a number of different different crops and seem to be getting you know getting similar responses. And when you say a result, what <clears throat> what did you see? What was, what was that result? What was the sort of the, the numbers or the the actual thing that was being impacted or progressed by the use of it? So. Uh, with the trial work that we did, um, we were basically putting a lot of spores out in a, in a small area. So it's not necessarily in a, in a traditional agronomic um, agricultural in, in environment that we'd normally do that. So um, we would put uh, sterilised uh, wheat seed um, with the endophytes without um, and put measured amount of wheat, dug them in, in alongside plants um, in a replicated fashion and so you're putting the same amount of making sure you're putting the same amount of carbon in the soil with the wheat um, and then we just measured the, the different um, yield no I didn't measure yield because they're <coughs> only small plots okay so we just 
took soil samples of carbon and then sent those soil samples away and measured. And we were seeing, you know, we were seeing similar numbers to what Peter saw. So it was just really for us getting our heads around, you know, can we do this in an agricultural system? So the, so the, 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 the impact was, was, a, was a carbon sequestration, basically. There was a, was a measured, measured yes. increase in carbon. In terms of the plant's um, productivity or the yield or the health, was there was there some measurements you know, of, of, the, of the impact of, on production of that, of that? Again, we didn't follow it through because it's only a small area, so we, couldn't, yeah. we didn't do yield or anything like that. We were just looking at it purely from a carbon perspective. Right. But you could see, um, yeah, on the canola especially, it was physical. You could see that soil that actually changed colour in that. Mm. It was quite, I'll never mm. forget when the guy sent me through the photos of this, of this canola sample. It was just, yeah, it was incredible. Mm. So is is there have there been trials done since, or is there plans to do trials where um, a bit more broad acre, um, you know, um, with with measurements of soil carbon, you know, biology activity, um, yield potentially of whether it's cotton or wheat, or you know, and, and actually um, nutritional, you know, like bricks testing of, of the of the of the of mm. the plants growing in use having used the the um, the inoculant. Well, like, yeah, I was saying, you know, Guy and I quite naively thought, well, we'll just pick up where Peter left off and get this technology up and, you know, up and going. It shouldn't be too hard. Who, who, needs, who needs a PhD? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> we'll have a crack. <laughs> and, um, again, we just thought, imagine that. I mean, because we just uh, know, you know, I'm a big believer that if we're going to mitigate um, climate change, that agriculture is going to have to play a massive role and we can't, you know, I'm a big fan of things like um, – permaculture I'm you know fan of you know what you're doing with the biodynamics all things like that which are that that are really good in their own right but the how are we going to get mainstream agriculture over the line you know um and and that's what I see is that it's about all about firstly adoptability that's easy for farmers to do and um again it's just an evolution that we're trying to create and so it's evolving from where we are now um and and yeah being able to ha have that repeatability reliability every time and like i say use that the nitrogen um uh, uh example rhizobium like we tripped over rhizobium back in the early 1900s um where scientists dug up um you know a legume and found nodules on the on the route um, and thought, holy hell, that's nitrogen. Well, only one place does it come from is the atmosphere. Hey, you know, so told his peers, like, well, this is unreal. Imagine uh, we could. And there's a heap of it up there. Yeah, there's a heap of it. Heap of, <laughs> bloody 73% or whatever it is. Like, geez, you know, let's, let's get us some of that. We said, why don't we, we should inoculate all our, our legumes. And apparently the time, you know, it was ridiculed. Mm. Um and witchcraft, uh, yeah, and um, but they set about doing the work, and um, and here we are, seventy years later, um, that there is not a farmer in the world anywhere that when he plants a legume doesn't put mm. that specific microbe um, on that specific plant to get a reliable, repeatable outcome every time, and that's thirty units of N for every ton of biomass that you grow. If you follow the instructions on the paddock, on the packet, mm. um, you'll get that. You know, and that's where the biological farming piece sort of needs to to be able to get to that reliability. Step out of the, you know, the for mainstream, it's got to step step out of that sort of snake oil, snake oil sort of tag. Um, and we get it, you know, a, a lot of the the true believers um, we label us as probably a tech fix, and it's just so not. Um, you know, it's not at the expense. Of the, of the rest of the microbiome. It's just ensuring that certain sets of species are in there in critical amounts that gets a reliable, repeatable outcome every time. And we're looking to put forward a soil carbon inoculum package. Um, so we've got the carbon endophytes in there, um, water stress relieving endophytes, um, nitrogen fixing endophytes, um, you know, potentially pea solubilizing um, bacteria, all these things are ensuring that they're not at the expense of, but ensuring that they're in that mix. And will that be available uh, um, uh, for, for, for purchase? And, and is, is that going to be a, 
um, a dressing, basically a seed, a seed dressing. Is that how? how yep. it, yeah. So, and it's something that farmers are really, um, you know, technology Do farmers I, already yeah. already use, and they're happy to use. It's pain in the ass that you have to inoculate your uh, mm. your legumes, and mm. uh, you know, we all finish planting planting your pulses or your legumes or whatever, and then you um, get on your wheat, and you just think, you know, thank God that's over, and I don't have to. <laughs> seed dress my seed anymore but <laughs> if it means we have to do that and who knows how how we'll do it we might put it you know we're looking at putting it with granules or mm. um yeah as a liquid inject or as a seed dressing so it's a number of ways of doing it but um yeah that's um i suppose that's where it evolved to evolve from is that after that meeting with Peter and Guy and I thought, well, naively thought well we'll just take this forward and we'd heard about we thought if we're really transparent about this um, why don't we set this up uh, as a um, as a not for profit and and because we'd heard about these trillions of dollars for um, for climate philanthropy yeah. that that that's out there climate and thought, initiatives yeah surely there'll be someone who'll get this and see the impact and the potential and you know if we if we can if people can really get our why of what we what it is that we're trying to do um, surely we'll we'll get supported and supported in the time frame that we need to so I thought no point. Building it up and hiding it in one corner of the world, I need to find that it could have solved the problem, but mm. you know, but we ran out of time. So that's really what what drove us. So um, we were both really uh, really aligned um, with that, and we, yeah, like I said, we bloody um, did it on the on the side forever. Guy Webb was an absolute trojan um, with it; like he was just relentless. I was more his wingman, um, but he was, yeah. Um, did an amazing job to to keep Source Quest going, um, keeping his day job. Um, what, what what was Source Quest at the time? Like what 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 did you had you created in in, in Source Quest? So, um, well, we Source Quest was just basically guy himself initially, and um, you know we we're putting in trials and we put these. You know, you look back now and you look at the videos and that we did, but we all evolved from. You know, like I said, it's almost. It's really quite naive to think you're going to. You have, a, have to have a certain amount of naivety to think you're going to pull something like this off. Totally. Um, otherwise, if you, you thought too much about if it, if you thought you too go, much, it's just oh, you you're having to lend yourself, mate. Like, <laughs> are you kidding? Like, seriously, you're a cocky from Trangy. You reckon you're going to, you know, <laughs> you're save the planet? Yeah, I know. And that um, take that on. And uh, that uh, that's what sort of you know what was driving us. Um, the you know that whole the whole journey, but. Yeah, it sort of evolved from there. We picked up people along the way that could see what we're trying to do, and and you know we had other people that were giving up their day jobs as well to come on board. And thinking, geez, you guys got a lot of faith in what is it we're doing? And that, <laughs> no but, that, but, that but that buoyed us <clears throat> as well. So you know, um, it, it really has been a joint effort. We've just pulled people in that are just so good at what they do. Um, you know. Uh, Frank, um, Ollie, and uh, and Teague Knock. They did a documentary on the project, and that was one thing that launched. Grass, this, um, yeah, grass grassroots. Roots. Yeah. yeah, so we'll put that in the show notes for people to, to to check out. And that was a that was a real catalyst. You Frank, start you start in that one, Mick. Oh well, I don't know about that, but Frank did a mass. He, he did just did a great job, and one bloody. Uh, these documentaries. Well, you're very famous in Slovenia. Is that right? <laughs> I think it was Slovenia where we won. <laughs> but we won. He won the best documentary all around the world. Like it literally went around the world, and that really gave us some exposure, mm. um, and it got us to that next level. Like we, you know, first of all, Guy and I went to government, and they sent us. The, you know, went to the local member as you do, and say, "We well, got a great idea." You know, like get us in and see that. You know, someone mm. in government. Surely government will fund this. Mm. But mind you, they That's they true, funded um, the Rhizobium. Um, uh, a knock on all those years ago. Yeah. Yes, um, but that, I mean that was a good, good, good point there. You know, it was a totally different sort of funding and and research environment back then, wasn't it? That oh, it would quite, have been totally quite, quite anyway. The, yeah, the vested interest as there is now. So yeah, it sent us off to seem like we're in the right place, a carbon farming initiative, mm. and um, and they just couldn't get it for whatever reason. You know, it was really frustrating. We've had lots of highs and. And lots of lows um, mm. along the way, but we just kept picking ourselves up and and pushing on with it. And like I say, Guy was an absolute um, uh, absolute trojan with it. Um, so then the the next big breakthrough, uh, I suppose, was a mate of mine or mate of ours. Mm. You know, 
um, Sarah Porter, uh, who was working working for the BBC at the time in Singapore, said, "Hey, I've been talking to my boss about what it is you're up to, and they're really keen to do a do a story on you." And I said, oh, "Really?" And she goes, "Yeah, 90 million people breakfast, you know, TV, you're up for it." And I thought. <laughs> Oh, you know, a big break, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so I remember I was just, it was Monday morning and I was all weekend and I had it all worked out what I was going to say. Your script. And, oh, <clears throat> you know, and I just thought. How many minutes did you did you know you had? Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. And I just thought, if I, if I spoke really quickly, I'd get it every <laughs> year. I had, to, had to say. Um, it was quite funny. I look back now and I cringe as you tend to, but um Anyway, it was uh, it seemed, it had the desired effect. I got off the I got off the call. Well, first of all, she started off. Yes, now we're going live now to Mick from Trangi. He's talking about using <laughs> Trangy soil in f- yeah, Australia, yeah, fungi to sequester carbon. And yeah, tell us more about that, Mick. Well, <laughs> <laughs> have you got three hours? <laughs> so um, anyway. Hardo, who's our CEO of Soil Carbon Company now, rang me up. 15 minutes later, I get off the call and I'm just going, oh, geez, I should have done that. I should have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I, you know. And he said, what the hell did you just do? And I said, what do you mean? What did I just do? And he said, I just had Horizon Ventures just uh, ring, me, ring me up um, and they want, to, um, they want to talk to us. And I've gone, we'd been talking to them before the man on the ground here in Australia. Hardo had been, had, sort of pitched to him, but it's like, yeah, they're not for profit. You know, we're all about commercial, um, you know, mm. entities that we're looking at and it's not really our bag. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, his boss in the um, uh, um, overseas had, had in Singapore had heard the, heard the, um, the interview and um, said, let's talk to these guys. So that's where it's evolved to now. We got – so the, the – um, they're the lead investor, um, and uh, so we've raised about ten million all told. Mm. Um, we've got uh, under, under the under the um, the soil carbon soil company. Carbon, soil carbon company. So yeah. soil carbon company was spun out of out of soil sequest, and we've kept the so the the not for profit is the largest shareholder of of soil carbon company. So um, when it's up and um, you know, we're up and we're a running entity and selling product. There'll be money feeding back into the into mm. the not for profit, and that's my that's my part probably more so. I'm not really, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not into breeding, you know, to, to doing all the lab work and and running that side of it. I'm more about the systems. You look very fetching in a lab coat and a, <laughs> and a beaker in your hand there. Mick. Yeah, yeah, um, but I'm. I think there's just so much work that needs to be done to developing systems. Um, for carbon sequestration, so we need technologies, um, but we also need the systems to to overlay those technologies in, and and systems that you know, if you listen to Facebook, you just do what one bloke does in Bismarck, North Dakota, and you know, happy days. It's just cover crops, and magically it all it all happens. But you know, in reality, and I've been there. Like anyone who's dabbled in this space, not not hard to take some bark off, um, you know trying some of these things on and you've got to have a really measured approach. Um, so we do – it's not to say that the system won't work in all – wherever we – you know, all through the wheat belt in, in Australia, but there's regionally specific systems that are going to, going to work and it's about we need to develop those systems um, going, going forward and working, yeah. working with farmers. And this is the thing for me, you know, as you know, farmers are really resourceful people and – all the all the solutions I reckon are, are trapped in in farmers' heads, mm-hmm. and we just need to facilitate and enable those farmers and those ideas. And that's that's really the purpose of the of the not for profit um, part of the of the entity. And that's um, what we really so where there's a product attached, um, soil carbon company will be developing um, the product mm-hmm. and the system stuff. So, guy and I often. Use the analogy: If we're going to solve climate change, you need to be able to pull on every lever, um, and it, it sort of gives you access to to um, all um, funding streams. So you've got venture capital as well as the, you know um, philanthropy um, as well to drive those systems. Like I say, where there's not a product to be sold. So um, let's imagine, Mick, that uh, there's a product. It's 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 av- it's available. You know, it, I guess it's it's. Um, Genesis, um, well, I guess you know the trials were with wheat and, and cotton, and so a cropping background. How how do you see um, it 
being uh, adop- uh, not adopted, adapted by or, or relevant to graziers? How, how can you see it sort of fit into their system? It can. I, 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 we don't know all of these things. Mm. Maybe we're in. Just we're imagine. From, put your imagine yeah. cap on. We've got, um, and we're we're working on it now. So it's um, we are looking to develop into grazing systems. Mm. But the, where the where the leverage point is um, for uh, for cropping systems is that you are you've got that uh, economic. You know that, that that market or that model that you're putting in private investments, putting in that planting an area the size of South America every year, and they're handling that seed. And there's that opportunity to put to match that seed like with specific yeah. microbes. On you're doing it every year, yeah. you know, um, and uh, you know that's often what people sort of say. Oh, that the purists will say, oh, they'll never compete with the native microbes. Um, saying, so, well, we do it with. Um, uh, with rhizobium and it works and uh, and it doesn't have to stay there because we're doing it every year. But these are the things we need to tease out. Which ones will stay there? Which ones, um, you know, will be there, uh, don't need to be re-inoculated and that's probably where the strength will be with the grazing systems. Again, you know, like an area the size of, size of South America that we farm but an area the size of Africa that we graze. Mm. So do you know what I mean? The, that and these are all carbon sinks. The only carbon sinks that we've really got any control over, and they just have to be leveraged. Um, and oh, I was going to make some profound point. Then it's just left me. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Um, I can't remember what it was now. I think uh, was something to do with grazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Oh. <laughs> no, it was gonna it was gonna chime straight in there with yeah. what we were just talking. So there about. is, I mean, there is uh, the uh, the there are there are challenges with grazing systems mm. to answer your question, um, but they're, they're, they won't be ins- insurmountable. Uh, and a, and a lot of them too, I suppose. That a lot of people now are uh, we're bringing um, animals back into our into our farming mm. systems. It's funny, you know, like blokes sort of our vintage came home. Um, from uh, from school, you know, um, and it's the when the no till movement happened. I think the no till movement is a really good example uh, of you know we've got a precedent for farmers um, having already done this because I don't know if you remember when no till first came out it was it was breakthrough it was revolutionary. First and foremost, it was cheaper for the farmer. Mm. It took less time, mm. so you weren't sitting on your your paddocks weren't blowing away, you were ploughing and you are making dust and you're thinking, oh, well, that's what we do. It's just mm. how agriculture yep. is. Um, and, um, you know, then the technology sort of came in that we had no-till planters and and um, and the chemistry. It was a step in the right direction, um, but it wasn't the panacea that everyone thought it was. But I, I, if you remember, everyone was singing the praises of, of no-till farming. Mm. If you weren't no-till farming, we're building carbon and, y- right. you know, like it's soil health and mm. there's, mm. you know, farmers could see it. I was sort of like white-knuckled at the pulpit preaching the gospel, you know. It really was. It was almost a, se- a step sideways and, and forward in a way, wasn't it? It was like, okay, it's not what we were doing. We're not ploughing in the dust, you know, blowing it away. But there was, there was also a... Um, Again, we can say that in hindsight because we, we, we're so much further down the track, I think, now. Than, it's definitely, than definitely a step forward, um, I think, mm. without a doubt. I mean, the, the ploughing uh, yeah. was just so, so destructive. So it sort of went to, to that point of, uh, of um, you know, people really excited and how much carbon we're building. And they got the point we just worked out. The science came back and said we're just losing carbon less slowly. And it was just yeah, like, right. yep. <sighs> Shoulder slumped as you were, you know, back to where we were. Um, so we do need the no-till system, but we also – what the key part is restoring that biological Biology. function, yeah. you know, and how do we do that inside of, uh, of agricultural mm. enterprises as they are now without going broke. We've got to have a, we've got to have a focus on, on, on um, you know, profit. Um, mm. for, profit, got to tick, profit driven. Yeah, yeah, we've got to tick that box. Um, first and first and foremost. And, um, I, I remember I was going to say now, Mick. I was going to say that. Um, Geez, it wants to be profound now. No, it's 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 pretty lame, really. Oh, okay. No, it was that. Um, you know, people say, "Oh, you got to use the." We're back to grazing. That's right. I mean, I think there's a, there's a fair argument to say that that. Um, yeah, or what's not to say that those microbes and the you know the fungus and the 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 what we're now inoculating, what one might inoculate their seed with, whether it's a pasture seed or it's a it's a wheat or it's a 
cotton seed or whatever. You know, those types of, of microbes weren't there before, once upon a time, you know, that, we've, that, that, that we are almost replacing or, or putting back into the system what used to be there because we just don't we, – what we do know is that the soil, the degradation of soil over the last 230 years has been massive. You know, we're back to a lot of the places that are actually farming subsoil, not necessarily topsoil. Yes. And that um, – that's not the environment. That's not a. That's not a, an environment where microbes who flourish in a topsoil are going to flourish now. Just like you know, let's go. You, you, we expect you to start growing some decent sort of food. So um, I think that you know, we we. I mean, not for the naysayers necessarily, but just that you know, more, what what you're doing, what can be done, is really trying to get back to a system that is that it, that it could have possibly been been you know. Um, could have existed all those years ago. You know, you sort of like, okay, well, we can wait for nature to try and get these the the, the right, as it were, fun, fun, um, you know, microbes in there to do a job to sequester carbon. Because I'm, I've no doubt that 230 years ago plus there was a very healthy carbon cycle. There was lots of microbes and lots of activity, and we have we've taken it back to literally, you know, very small percentages of what used to be there. So you know, so it's not. You know, it's it's almost a, again a responsibility for us to to um, to put some of this stuff back. You know, and and and, and we're never going to get back to where it was. I'm not suggesting that, that farmers need to make it look like a you know the landscape used to be 230 years ago. But we're you know we we know that as you just said, you know, biology is is what we need to put back. And and yeah. and which leads me to the question: you know, How do you see? You know. I'm seeing a lot of um, emphasis on and, and funds being poured into ag tech mm-hmm. you know, as a solution to climate change, solution to food production, solution to environmental sort of you know um, let's 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 get it back on track. Do you have a uh, you know a, what, what's your sense of um, ag tech versus ag tech and all? And all and it's, it's a pretty broad topic. You know, there's 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 apps, there's machinery, there's there's sort of you know there's I guess a tech industrial sort of side of it versus a biological mindset. Have you mm. got a sort of a view, a view oh, on that? I, I just think, you know, that the only way that farmers will mitigate uh, um, against climate change going forward in a variable climate, there's only one way. It's not going to be an app. But, you know, it's it's increasing soil carbon. That mm. is the literally the only way we can mitigate, mitigate ourselves against a variable climate. So those things are all real, and it's exciting. Like it really is the, you know, the remote um, technology, autonomous tractors, all these things are going to be fantastic and we're r- really moving into an exciting time of agriculture. But, um, yeah, all of those are for nothing unless we can crack this soil carbon nut, yeah. Um, talking about nuts, what do, 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 what's your... <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do your neighbours, or not say your neighbours, but does the <laughs> does the um, does the you know the farming community of Trenji, um or anywhere? I mean, how 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 are you fitting in? What 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 are, what, are, what do people think of? Oh, I think a lot of people are really receptive about you know what it is that we're uh, you know that I'm trying to do. I'm I'm not you know I don't profess to to know everything or be doing things you know. Brilliantly, I've got, yeah, you know, I've got so many, um, a lot of room for for improvement. And like I say, my system's evolving, and I'm still using conventional. You know, it's not like I'm doing everything, um, uh, you know, a certain way. I'm still using, um, you know, chemistry, and 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 we have to inside of our our system. So it's about I'm just really strategic um, about how how we use. Um, you know, specific tools and and ensure that when we're using them, um, yeah, we can we can um, negate their deleterious of effect as much as possible where we have to mm. have to use them. But um, yeah, so I, any I, pushback, you know? Oh yeah, are... yeah, not none, none that I listen to, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, um, I think most people are. are often genuinely interested in, in what it is that we're, you know, that we're trying to do. Well, there you go. That's the, uh, that's the end of part one with Mick Wetton Hall. Fascinating chat um, here at the veranda of Weema Bar um, as the rain um, started to fall. But you'll hear all about that in uh, next week's episode in part two. So uh, stay tuned for that uh, second half of uh, the interview with Mick Wetton Hall.
This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.